You know, the funny thing about the WAN show today is that we were supposed to start on time. In fact, I've been in here for over an hour doing my test call with our special guest today, doing my, uh, what, I don't know, whatever else it is that I do to prepare for the show. But, um, you know, it's funny because it feels like sometimes the more ahead of schedule you are, the more time you'll waste thinking, ah, it's okay, I got lots of time, no big deal, everything's fine, and then it's 4.30 and you're like, oh yeah, I forgot to record the, the intro where I intro the topics of the show today, and I forgot to, oh, you know, actually check and make sure that your special guest Paul from Paul's Hardware, formerly New Egg TV, is actually using the microphone that he's actually going to use for the, uh, the the guest segment because right now we just have a super de duper silent guest over there who has two microphones one on his desk and one on his face and then actually another one on his table he has many microphones none of which appear to actually do anything for the moment so we're gonna go through the super de duper special call out topics today first up is Apple's event the uh, the so-called October 2014 event that happened yesterday and included all the most amazing, unbelievable, magical, revolutionary technologies that you can possibly imagine. So basically smaller, thinner, better battery life, more powerful, but basically the same stuff. Um, then also Google announces the Nexus's 6 and 9, which are... I'll let you guess which one's a phone and which one's a tablet. We don't know because Nexuses are just, they're like this weird, I don't, whatever, I lost the word. The point is we get, we're getting a phone and a tablet and they're going to be good. And um, one thing that's kind of missing, particularly on the phone side, is usually with a Nexus device, it's all about the sort of the cheap bang for the buckness, and that doesn't seem to be happening this time. Also in the news this week, Ubisoft just keeps on digging, don't they? A Redditor, actually a member of the PC Master Race subreddit, um, had a presentation at his school, and... Uh, Wow, yeah, a couple of uh, Ubisoft representatives there said some stuff that is going to light the internet on fire yet again. It's like Ubisoft wants to burn down the whole internet, and that's the objective here. Um, finally, Netflix raises prices on 4K streams. That was a bit of a cop-out topic. I didn't try that hard to find another one that was amazing because we are going to have a lot to talk about this week regardless. At least I'll talk and Paul will listen because I don't think he can talk yet. Paul, you got that working over there? <laughs> Let's just roll the intro. Oh yeah, we got sponsors today, guys. We got Squarespace. Squarespace.com slash Linus, 10% off with the offer code Linus. Also, we got 5-4 Club back sponsoring this week's episode with a special special offer, one that actually looks pretty darn compelling. Last time around, they were slipping cash into people's packages, the kind of thing that's normally only acceptable at certain establishments. This time around, they've got a whole other thing going on, and I'll give you the details about that later on in the show. So hopefully Paul is back with us. Paul, you good? I muted nothing. Oh, that's right. I did mute you, didn't I? Oh, there's our problem. All right. Well, let's open up the volume mixer and see if Paul is uh, functioning over there. Does it? Do, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Wow. It's Good. amazing how uh, changing the volume mixer works over there. Mm. So um, Twitch chat, please feel free. Let me know if Paul is an appropriate volume because he's going to be with us pretty much for the rest of the show. I feel like I kind of owe him one after we kicked him off of the guest segment a few weeks back after pretty unceremoniously after like what six minutes or something like that well i think i can understand from a viewer's perspective if it's affecting the quality of the stream you, you gotta you gotta you know 
sometimes you gotta t make some sacrifices. Yeah, and I'm definitely gonna sacrifice you before me, so there's that. But uh, note, note, you can see this week, no problem. So now we're gonna have uh, Windows Beautiful. Task Manager replacing Paul instead of instead of having Paul. We'll just have the task manager showing off how our CPU usage is now in the 35 to 60% range, where last time we had Paul on, his presence was so powerful that he overloaded my system. Actually, I've upgraded it now, so. Well, Kyle was here too. He might have affected that. Well, we'll see what kind of effect Kyle has, because he's going to be joining us in a little bit, correct? That is true. Yes, uh, he should be appearing at my door at any moment, so I'll, I'll have to jump up and, and get him really quick. Um, he said he was on his way, maybe 10 minutes. So Fantastic. Sure All right, will. well, why don't we jump right into our first topic here today, then? Oh, you know what I just realized? I'm not sure if they're going to be able to hear you when I switch to screen sharing on my computer here, but uh, oh we'll, do, we'll do our best with it. So this was originally posted on the forum by Lord Kitty, and the source is a, uh, a Reddit post in the PC Master Race subreddit here. So I'm just going to go ahead. I'm going to add the uh the formerly of new egg tv crew to uh when we discuss these things there you go i'll just chuck you guys up in the corner there and basically there was a presentation at a member of the pc master race subreddit's school where some ubisoft folks came in in this case it was a game architect an online programmer and an hr representative and they gave this presentation and then there was some time for open q a and so <clears throat> <laughs> this uh, this redditor started to source questions from the subreddit and started to ask some well you know some of those questions that we've all got like what's happening to 60 fps and why exactly is this happening so when he asked about the industry moving away from 60 frames per second the game architect blamed settling for 30 fps on limitations which is uh, not in line with that whole cinematic line that we've been getting from you know pr representatives is it paul not not quite exactly but i i think the main the, the my first takeaway from this story is is it's fantastic that reddit has like fingers or tendrils spread out so you know so much that anywhere there happens to be a discussion like this going on there's gonna be somebody there like immediately posting it to reddit that's just that's just good to know because I, I think reddit is a, is a force for good for the most part for but the most uh part. For the most depends which which subreddits you. They're get a after, force. I, I would call them chaotic neutral, but maybe leaning towards good. Definitely chaotic. Well, we're getting off topic here, but that depends on your view of mankind entirely, doesn't it? Okay, we'll we'll, we'll come back to that. But <laughs> the main the main point here, I think, is is that there should never be a limitation on software simply as a result of one company feeling that they can either make more money for it from it or or reduce a competing platform's ability to perform uh, by comparison. And, and there's absolutely no reason for it. People, people do PC gaming because they know they can build a system and they can get performance that's in line with what, you know, the type of system that they build and the amount of money they invest. And a company artificially making a limitation just so people can't argue that, oh, well, on PC at least I can get 60 frames per second or 120 frames per second. Um, it's just not right, like, Which fundamentally. Which brings us to sort of the next thing the game architect said, and that was that um, sort of there it was implied, and this is the other problem with Reddit sometimes, is a Redditor, and, and you know, I love the anonymity of the internet as much as anyone, so I have a love-hate relationship with it. A Redditor can be anyone, and so when they say that the guy at the presentation implied something, well, that's the interpretation of that particular person, unless there were, you know, 50 people in the audience that all 100% agree that that's exactly what happened. But anyway, this post says that they implied that they're being pressured by the console makers to limit games to 30 FPS. And it was also, <clears throat> when asked about Watch Dogs, the programmer mentioned that just before they release a game, they have to send a copy to the console manufacturers who have the final say on what to keep and what to throw away before the game is made. Why should console manufacturers have any say in what does or does not go into the PC version of a game? Like that's 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 the problem right there. That like they shouldn't have to green light what 
people can do on a can- like does does Sony have to go and, and approve what can go in the Microsoft version of the game or vice versa? I I don't think so. Now that would be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> be an interesting conversation to like be a fly on the wall for probably so basically basically that's it and then the redditor also posted that at the end of this whole conversation about the you know the negative response to locking assassin's creed unity to 30 fps um you know he commented on the console limitations the choice between graphical fidelity and smoothness um and also said our eyes can't see past 24 FPS anyway, and then apparently gave a wink. So I, I, I don't know what's going on at Ubisoft, but it really feels like they have a civil war over there right now between the people internally who feel like they should be building the best thing that they can and the people internally, probably more along the bean counter lines, um, who feel they should do whatever is going to make them the best most amount of money, whether that is through a partnership with a console maker, or whether that is through selling more copies of the console version and making sure that the console buyer is appeased, because that's an angle that I think a lot of people aren't considering. Everyone kind of goes, oh, well, they're in bed with Sony and they're in bed with Microsoft to limit the PC version, and we saw that with Watch Dogs. Ubisoft can deny it all we want, all they want, but pretty much we know that's what happened but something that they're probably not considering is that console maker aside the console gamer is not going to want to see like when there's when there are subtle differences in image quality you know how the console PC, you know, flame war comment thing that happens. Anytime any of this crap comes up, the console gamers are going to try to say, oh, well, it doesn't look that different. What if it did look that different? How would they feel about their purchase? How would they feel about buying more games for that console? Because not every console player is going to instantly turn into a PC gamer if they feel disenfranchised about console gaming. Well, it definitely makes the PC gaming argument a lot more compelling if that's the case. But I mean, the the other thing about this this most recent generation of consoles that came out is they are not nearly as overpowered compared to like PlayStation Two and Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty when they came out. So that also to me says that whereas earlier versions of the consoles they took a pretty big loss on selling the hardware every time it is probably less of that because the hardware they're using in there is really not as expensive. So that also provides a more compelling reason to deter people from going into PC gaming and buying the consoles is because they're not, I I, I mean, I can't say this for sure, but I would assume that they're not necessarily taking as much of a loss on the console hardware as as they used to. No, no, definitely not. Um, I've got a, another interesting point here that's h- kind of hidden in the notes on this topic, but I thought it was—I thought it was an interesting point of discussion. So, <clears throat> Assassin's Creed Unity is going to have eight hours of DLC before the game is even close to release, bringing the total cost, if you want to go for like a season's pass pre-order, to ninety dollars. If you want to count all the content created before release as release content even though you actually have to pay extra for some of it and i think we should we should probably do a twitter blitz on this but do you think given that a game was going to cost you 59.99 actually you know what we should go back and find some find some old games what was the release price of starcraft 1 like paul do you remember starcraft 1 i believe was Probably forty. That, that's that's when I think the the most you could charge for a PC game, even a AAA title, was forty bucks. I, uh, it might have been as low as thirty, but I'm I'm gonna go with forty. Because I seem to remember buying games like cartridge games back on SNES, like pretty old games if for fifty, and sometimes sometimes even more. Like what did what did Final Fantasy VI cost at launch? Six I didn't play, but seven was 50 bucks, definitely. Okay, so if in 1994, so we're talking 20 years ago, I think was around the time Final Fantasy VI came out. If we're talking 20 years ago, something was 50 bucks, should it be $60 today? I mean, let's find an inflation calculator. Guys, I want you to start blitzing at me with this. Is $90 completely unreasonable? If so you, think- you can get a slightly reduced experience for 60 when we factor in inflation. You think the increased price might be reasonable due to the 
better game fidelity, increased mechanics. Uh, Maybe not better I mean, game fidelity, because I think that is that is, opens up a whole can of worms. But I would say the increased cost of making a game mm -hmm. and the increase in uh, okay and general inflation. You might need to go get that. I think Kyle's here. One second. All right, so I'm gonna use an uh, I'm gonna use a uh, an inflation calculator here. I'm gonna go 1994, something that cost 50 bucks. And we're going to calculate it. So apparently, according to uh, at least the Bank of Canada inflation calculator here, something that was 50 bucks in 1994 should be 73.22. And then when we factor in how much more a game costs to make these days, is it unreasonable for them to ask for 90 bucks for it? All right, let's start going to the Twitter boards here because I'm very interested to hear what you guys have to say. What a warm welcome. Hey, everyone. Oh. Uh, you're you're actually not you're not live right now, Kyle. But he has no headset on, so he doesn't he doesn't know these things. All right, I'm trying to reload here. All right, Alan Hinkson says that's the last straw. I'm boycotting Ubisoft. Uh, PC games should never be locked at 30 FPS, and ninety dollars is ridiculous. Owen says I paid eighty nine ninety nine for Warcraft three in two thousand, and some SNES games were seventy nine ninety nine. All right, like special edition versions. Frank says, yeah, I didn't think Warcraft 3 was that expensive. I think I paid 60 for it. But then I, I got like a French... The battle chest that had like all of the versions together that, that they released. Like, yeah, but then expansions. if you if you treat an expansion pack like um, like DLC, which it basically is, I mean, that's pretty much exactly the same concept, then maybe $90 for a game and a couple expansion packs is equivalent to $90 plus a couple of DLCs. No? Maybe? But in the past, I think they would have gone the route with the game they release at launch is pretty much what they've worked on up till then, and then they work on like more stuff. So if this stuff's already available, then maybe it should have just been integrated into the game from the get go, rather than trying to immediately have like a an upsell for people. So if they kept it secret for you, then you would feel better about it. Like if they <laughs> if they kind of like kept it on a you know a thumb drive somewhere so that no one knew about it and then brought it out two weeks after the game comes out then it's okay yes. i mean i don't really see the difference personally uh from a, i mean you run a business do you tell everything about your business publicly i mean there there even though it is sort of an ignorance is bliss kind of thing it, there is something to be said if they hadn't talked about this and maybe had given it even two weeks or a month then maybe they could have done it. But the reason they're probably talking about it now is because they want to have this stuff in time for the holiday season, Q4, all that good stuff. So that's basically it. They're just capitalizing on the hype train because, let's face it, more people are going to buy deluxe editions and extra DLC when the game is all over every internet banner everywhere and in everyone's face versus if they wait three to four weeks and try to get that $30 upsell at that point. So, yeah, I guess I see why they're doing it, but I can also see why it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of lame. I mean, hardware makers. We see this kind of thing all the time. It's not like Nvidia is not already working on GTX 1080 and 1180. They're already working on them, but they're not going to tell us about all that crap now because they still want to sell us some 980s and they still want us to feel somewhat okay about buying 980s when there's something that much better coming down the pipe. So, so you think they could just be decent? It would be more decent of them to just not tell us then. I think Even people wouldn't. I, th I think people wouldn't be having this argument over whether or not it's it's a thing to be done for a large video game maker. I mean. Uh, uh, Assassin's Creed is, is is huge, so obviously it's extremely profitable. It's just I think I think the point at which people start to get upset is the point at which they feel that the decision is being made much much more for the monetary reasons than it is for giving gamers like the best time they could have or the most amount of content that they could give them. Right. Yeah. All right. Let's go through some uh, let's go through some tweets here. And welcome to the show, Kyle. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. All right, we're Actually, getting some pretty good tweets from people here. Action 52 for the NES was $199.99 in 1991. Iron Hawk says it's all about the money. They're announcing the DLC for hyping the game even more. You know what? That's a very good point because something that works really well for selling more of something is just this. 
just talking about it. Word Even us talking about this DLC right now is creating more exposure for Assassin's Creed Unity, for better or for worse. That's why we get that AC money, right? That's right. That's why I get so much money from Ubisoft for my, <laughs> uh, like my digging references. <laughs> they love me. Uh, Brad's Coolio. I find it funny that AAA titles are so expensive, whereas indie games, actual good games, are so cheap. Okay, Brad's Coolio, I'm going to have to disagree with you. You can't generalize that way. There are AAA titles that aren't that expensive. I Tomb, Tomb Raider 2013 was on Midweek Madness for, what was it, like $10 or something this week? It's a great game. Yes, it's a little bit older, but that's how life works. If you want the, you know, if you want to watch the latest movie then you go to it in the theater if you want to watch the oldest movie then you like find it in a value bin that's that's how it works and in saying indie games are actual good games yes there are good indie games but i think to say that every indie game is good is is ridiculous there's or to of, generalize that they're terrible good. indie games too there's a lot of just horrible indie games and if we count the indie games that get funded on services like kickstarter and don't get made then there's some really abysmal indie games. Those are, those are like actionable indie games, in my opinion. Apparently Tomb Raider was three ninety nine. so there you go. You can get Tomb Raider 2013 for $4. You should is probably that, go buy is it. Is that the one that came with the life-size Lara Croft doll? No. That's um, kind of creepy. Which one did you buy? <laughs> <laughs> well, for 400 bucks, you, they better throw something. No, $4. Oh, $4. <laughs> Why would you want a life-size Lara Croft? Okay, tell me something. We should do. Okay, we should probably do a straw poll here. Um, would you idea. buy a, a life-size Lara Croft doll? No, no, it's oh, not. Really? Would you buy? It? Because I have to assume that everyone on this stream would probably buy it. What I want to know is, would you prefer original Tomb Raider Lara Croft, Tomb Raider 2013 Lara Croft, or Angelina Jolie Lara Croft in the box? Could we so. get old school Lara Croft with the graphics and detail of current day? No, you have Lara to pick Croft? one. Ah, which Tomb Raider? Current uh, day Lara Croft, because she's a real woman. Excellent choice, <laughs> Kyle. I I agree. That's my reasoning. So Angelina Jolie, Lara Croft is not a real woman. Oh, was that an option? Was Angelina Jolie an option? Yeah, yeah. Well, you weren't even oh, listening. Sorry. All you heard was that. Lara Croft comes in the box, and you're like, boom, right. yeah. I didn't know this was such a, an open open topic. Uh, I just feel question. like I feel like she'd be kind of high maintenance. <laughs> Wait, yeah. so so if I if I pick the the current gen video game Lara Croft, does that mean I could control her just like in the game? No, because I would have no control over Angela. No, let's say they come with their respective personalities. Mm. Oh. What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd say I'd say current gen. Um, is this, current gen Laura Croft is because this, she seems like a down to earth chick, you know. Is this really the topic of the straw poll that you're creating? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just taking oh, okay. me a little while because I'm not signed into Twitch chat for some reason. I'm not sure what's <laughs> ah, going on here. I see. Stop it, Twitch! What are you doing? Log me in, please. Thank you. Stop being broken. Would appreciate that very I, much. I think I think this is where you and I are, have to start dancing and just distract the, the viewers while while Linus figures this out. That would actually be incredibly helpful right about now. <laughs> um, come on, do you have any props here? What can we no, can we do? I have a wine opener. Uh, Why are we talking about props? First, we're talking a, about blow up dolls. Now we're talking about props. <laughs> There's a C clamp over there. Wait, <laughs> I don't even want to know what you could do with a C clamp. All right, and a blow up doll. It's so let's take a couple more tweets about this whole Ubisoft thing, and then um, wow, forty-six new notifications. Man, you guys, you guys hit me so fast on Twitter these days. I don't think where's, games should be restricted in any way. Where's Luke, by the way? What happened Agreed. to Luke? Did he Sweden finally quit? You don't know where? Oh well, you've been oh, in Hawaii. Yeah, I've been, been in Hawaii. I've been out of so touch with reality. He's not for the aware last that week. Luke has been in Europe. He's in Europe. Oh, sweet. Luke has been in most of Europe. From from what I can just like tell. Dimitri is he and Dimitri like are they are they dating? They actually met oh, because when you awesome. go to Europe and there's somebody else in Europe, you meet that. You person. meet them in Europe. Yes. That's what you do. That is how Europe works. I think Europe. Daniel Hoff over there better be careful with ideas like that. Uh, he just tweeted: Imagine if Blizzard did DLC with WoW, where if you want access to a particular instance, you pay a small incremental amount for it. Wow. Well, they effectively have a much better deal going with a monthly subscription. That's true, but they could do both. 
I don't think people would go for that. That's... But they don't have to. That's the thing about DLC, is that nobody has to buy it. Well, there's plenty of, like, uh, uh, frilly, you know, uh, uh, vanity items and stuff in WoW that you can buy, like, in the store and stuff like that. I never bought any of them, but I, I will say that my wife did from time to time. She got the Star Pony. Your, your wife is very vain, all those. Did you ever have a Star Pony, Kyle? Vanity items. No, I never had a Star Pony. All right, what else we got for tweets here? Got people asking where they can buy a Gigabyte GTX 980? I don't know. On the <laughs> internet. Um, a. Graves says, I think increasing the price of AAA titles is not ridiculous, but might stop, start scaring off buyers. I mean, that's the thing that's scary here, is for all the vocal minority that's complaining about this, there's going to be lots of people who don't care, and then there's going to be the people who are actually buying it. And I guarantee you that if it was affecting sales in some kind of negative way, so if it was actually scaring off buyers, Mr. Graves, I guarantee you Ubisoft wouldn't be doing it. So there you go. Wow, Kimchi Manchu Mandu says, I don't mind the 30 FPS. I lock most of my games at 30 or 60, so I don't really mind. Not many PC gamers that do that. I sometimes do 60. It depends on the game, though. Really? That's one of the benefits of PC gaming, is that you don't have to conform to 30 FPS. You're not locked in. Yeah, v I, was doing, I was doing adaptive V-Sync for a while um, on games that supported it. I, I, I didn't mind it. I thought it was a... I mean, when you have a monitor that can't do more than 60 hertz anyway, I, I felt like there wasn't much benefit to going beyond that. Here's a tweet from rsmith17. You aren't taking into account that games sell many more copies now than they did, and this offsets the inflation. Okay, you can make that argument, but the price of an item is, has never been dictated by the cost of it. The price of an item is dictated by what it's worth to the buyer, and then it kind of scales with the market from there. So if, if, it's, if it was worth $60 or $50 or $80 or some of these older games people are tweeting, or even more, if it was worth that to the buyer then, then it's probably still worth that relative amount of income to the buyer now. So yeah, the fact that they're selling more copies of it means that they're going to make more money, but it doesn't mean that the that the, the that value the cost, of it has gone down. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't mean the value goes down per per user. It doesn't really work that way. I mean, they're businesses. They they are trying to make money, whether we sort of like this or not. And you know what? Indie developers are businesses. They if they make money, they're not going to be sad. You watch indie game the movie. You think the Super Meat Boy guy is like sad that his game sells lots of copies and he makes shed loads of money i mean yeah they do it out of passion sure but that doesn't mean they don't want to make money and they're about, not going to try to make about, money what about notch <clears throat> i'm sorry what about notch what a, what about notch he's made more money than like probably everyone in the town i'm in combined but he is also taking a step that will potentially make him a lot less money right but he has lots of money already and so he's reached he's reached a point of of, uh, of moneyness where where it doesn't really make a difference anymore. It kind of feels like that. Yeah. All right, so why don't we move on to our next topic here, which is fast charging batteries with a twenty year lifetime. This was posted by Michev on the forum, and the original article is from Engadget.com. I'm just going to go ahead and pop that up for you guys to enjoy. But this looks freaking promising. Apparently the technology is not super expensive to produce and we could be looking at batteries that can charge up to 70% and these would be new lithium ion batteries up to 70% in two minutes. That's Pretty. ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, wow. I mean, okay. So here, question, question for you guys or, and you can debate amongst yourselves, but what's more important to you? Long battery life or fast charging with the same battery life we have today? Uh, I'll go for long battery life because I'm pretty good about plugging in my phone every night. If my phone can last all day with heavy use, then it's going to get a full charge every night. So, uh, yeah, that would be it for me. Fast charging is nice, but at the end of the day, you still need something to charge it with. I would prefer just having a self-contained battery that lasts as long as it does, regardless of where I am or if I have an AC power outlet near me. 
I guess it's a lifestyle thing too, though, because if yeah. you're if you go to work where you have an outlet next to you, like you work at a desk, then fast charging is great. You just give it a zap whenever you need it. However, if you go to work where you're on the go all day and you're moving around and you're using your phone a lot, then I guess longer battery life is more useful. But either way, this will enable potentially devices with larger batteries to also be charged much more quickly. So if we had, you know, I, I usually assume when some research comes out and they talk about what percentage they can charge in X number of minutes uh, for like a, a phone, I usually assume they're talking about an iPhone. So we can say somewhere in the 1800 to 2100 milliamp hour range. Mm -hmm. So if you had a tablet, let's say a 6,000 milliamp hour battery or 5,000, oh no, they don't go up to that high, do they? What are they, usually like 4,000 to 6,000, somewhere in that range? I think three to five yeah. three to five. I've seen, yeah. Okay, well, whatever. So the point is we could maybe charge that to 70% in 10 minutes or five minutes or six minutes or whatever the case may be. So pretty darn exciting. So they're using titanium dioxide nanotubes for the anode rather than graphite, which speeds up the battery's chemical reactions, offering 10,000 charging cycles rather than the usual 500. So would that be something that's more important to you than the fast charging? The fact that now you can get 20 times longer life out of it, especially now that so many devices don't have removable batteries? When you first, when I first was looking at this story earlier, I, I was very excited initially because I'm always happy when I see battery technology improvements because I think that's just something that's lagged behind so so badly. Um, but my my secondary reaction was, I hope it doesn't have like some sort of negative impact. You know, I hope each one of these that they create doesn't you know kill ten baby seals or something like that. Um, so yeah, that that's that's a pretty big factor for me at this point um, when it goes into especially for technology is going to be the environmental impact it might have as well so, so uh, think of the children factor think of the children yes think of the, the seals the, the, our future but yeah I mean if you have something and it's going to last 10,000 char charging cycles rather than 500 it should last a lot longer hopefully maybe the device could last longer um, I mean, another discussion is, is, is if we're reaching a point of capability with the technology and the speed where devices might start lasting longer rather than being replaced in one or two years. Um, so, yeah. I, Timing I'd for this could be that. perfect then. Yeah. So you get a device that, you know, isn't really getting that much faster every generation, so you don't really feel the need to replace it so often. I mean, something like this could be great for your project Aura phone. So you could, you know, buy yourself a, a quick charge module versus the standard battery module and make that thing last freaking forever. I mean, once you have a portable device that can do, you know, say 4K resolution on a handheld display and have 48 hours of battery life, and, you know, apart from gameplay, what really stressful thing do you do with the phone? So as long as it's not physically wearing out um, or bending, then it should be able to last a reasonable amount of time. Question for you <clears throat> is, do we really even need 4K on a mobile display? I mean, have you, have you used the LG G3? <laughs> no, I haven't. Uh, I, I don't really think so. I think it's overkill. I think the retina displays and the small devices are pretty, pretty absurd um, a lot of the time. I mean... It's a, uh, it's a pixel race. Yeah. It's a pixel race for smartphones, I feel. And I wish there was more of a pixel race for, for PC monitors um, <laughs> because, you know, like the Nexus 6 is coming out and it's got a 2560 by 1440 screen. And most people that have monitors are still running 1080, which is, I, I, I find that ridiculous yeah. that a five and a half inch screen or a six inch screen, whatever, has a higher resolution than the monitor that you're using every day for work or for gaming and whatnot. When the uh, funniest thing about it is, y you know what? I've been using the iPhone 6 for over a week now, and it never occurred to me for even a second that the screen was low res, because it really, really doesn't matter. Like, relatively low res, it's still retina or whatever, but it's, it's not as high res as the 1M8 that I was using right before it. So yeah, it's, it's just funny you mentioned that. Not only can I not tell the difference between 1440p and 1080, but I couldn't even tell the difference stepping down to uh, whatever this is, because it's not 1080. I mean, there's definitely something to be said for getting up to that point where, you know, 1080 and beyond, because Steve's Steve's Windows phone that he has, he was showing to me, and that was my first thing I noticed about it, was like, oh, this has like an 800 by 600 display on it or something, which is why yeah. it cost him like 60 bucks. But yeah, I mean, once you, once you get to a certain amount of pixel density, I think it's really doesn't matter for a handheld device. 
All right. So speaking of handheld devices, why don't we uh, why don't we jump into Android 5.0 Lollipop, ne the Nexus 9, and the Nexus 6? So guys, uh, start hitting us on Twitter. So it's oh, I can't really point over there very well. There we go. Linus Tech on Twitter. Want to start hearing from you guys about Android 5.0 Lollipop, Nexus 9, and Nexus 6. What are your thoughts? We will go through some of those, but first let's sort of briefly run through exactly what's going on here. So. Um, Android 5.0 is coming in the next few months for the Nexus 5, 7, 10, and Google Play Edition devices, as well as the upcoming 6 and 9. So we now have Nexus's 5, 6, 7, 9, 10. Hmm. Wow, all at the same time. Amazing. What happened to 8? That's all I've ever wanted was an 8-inch Google device. Yeah, it would be great. I would rate it 8 out of 8, mate. Do you sound? I think my wife has one of those. Um, all right, so the Nexus Player streaming media device is also getting it. Its biggest new feature is material design. It overhauls almost all of the GUI. This is the biggest Android change since Ice Cream Sandwich back in 2011. It has new refined animations, a new color palette, revamped multitasking voice controls, and also brings 5,000 new APIs for developers to tap into and lets multiple devices and various form factors work together better. There's improved syncing options, new notification settings and controls, improved battery saving, something that I would be really happy to see because being back on iOS again has actually been super duper nice because particularly when the phone is idle, the power management is just so much better. Uh, multiple user accounts, something I, I guess we should have seen coming. I mean, as someone with a family, I'm not necessarily going to buy my five-year-old a phone, but I also don't want him running amok on my OS doing all my things when uh, it would be better if he just had his own playground. Um, and some third parties have added stuff like this already. So we've got, you know, HTC has a kid mode, if I recall correctly, and I think Samsung does as well. So now you can get it without subjecting yourself to, uh, to touch Wiz or using Sense. Um, what else is there in here? Multiple user accounts, a bit, bit, Yeah, so that's basically it. Now we can get into the hardware of the phone. So, Paul, want to run us through the Nexus 6? Maybe give us your thoughts? Uh, yeah, so this is, this is something that we were discussing a little bit before the show started, but I'm, I'm looking for a new phone soon. Actually, I have a new contract starting, and when I saw the Nexus 6, I was... Oh. Sorry, Kyle. It's okay. There you go. I want to. I want to be. I want to read it too. When I saw the Nexus Six, uh, I was like, "Ooh, like I want to get a new phone." I, I don't care really which phone I get at this point, but I want it to be a new one. Um, so it gave me some consideration. But yeah, five point nine six inches, twenty five sixty by fourteen forty uh, panel, which we were just talking about. Not a huge difference, but hey. It's it's a nice screen, I'm sure. 13 megapixel camera. Um, I like the 4K recording. That's I, I've been using my phone at times to to do random video recording here and there, and being able to record at 4K. That's that's pretty nice. Uh, two megapixel front facing camera um, for, the, for the selfies. I think it's got an f-stop of two as well. Oh, so yeah? it's got a pretty wide aperture, which means uh, you know you can get some. Good low lighting uh, performance as well as that nice defocused background. Go for a more cinematic feel. Do you think more this cinematic? Oh, you've got to be kidding me! So, you, so you're worried about <laughs> yeah. bokeh effects on selfies? Really? Of course. <laughs> it's uh, it's trending. I hate you you guys. Know? It's trending right now. The, if, what can I say? I mean, look at look at the filters that they have on uh, on Instagram. You know, the, that's one of the popular ones where they put the depth of field. You know, you blur everything except the, the subject. Take your social media to the next level, yeah. Linus. I'm very excited about Indulge. that. Indulge. Thirty-two. All right. Thirty-three thousand two hundred twenty milliamp hour battery is something that's is yeah. Whatever. That's been my biggest complaint recently. My phone battery is really really sucking lately in the last six months of its existence. Um, Mine too. So, so yeah. Hopefully the larger battery combined with the uh, the, the uh, lollipop features of uh, particularly saving power when it's like right about to shut off. That's what I hate. My phone. Battery runs out, and then I plug it in, and then I have to, like, w like if I'm going to bed and I use my phone as an alarm and the battery dies, and I go to plug it in, I have to, like, wait for five t plus minutes to get enough charge to turn it on so that my alarm will go off. That's yep. that's an annoyance that's happened to me several times. You know times what's funny is, um, yeah, I mean, this is, this looks like, this looks like, um, Google catching up to what other guys were already doing, like Samsung had that, 
high mm-hmm. endurance mode or whatever they were calling it, where your phone could last for like multiple days on a few percent charge because it just like didn't do basically anything. It was like two color display and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's funny that you mentioned that problem with your phone because I don't know about other manufacturers, but HTC actually reserves enough battery to wake itself up to have an alarm go off even if it dies in the middle of the night. So That's you might awesome. want to. Find find a manufacturer whose phone does that. I do love HTC phone, or uh, there have been many HTC phones that I've enjoyed in the past. Uh, my wife has the one, and she she's really enjoyed it, and she uses it to, she uses it to play audiobooks. So thoughts on the six forty nine ninety nine unlocked price point though? I was disappointed. That That's was a, steep. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, it's too early to say now, too. But I mean, there was also a rumor the day I think the day of the the launch of these, or when they, you know, when they first started discussing them publicly, that uh, I think AT and T had posted the pre order or something accidentally for the Nexus Six, and it was like fifty bucks on contract. And I, I'm starting to think like that might have been just a mistake and probably not actually going to be what what, what they're going to charge for it because six fifty with contract is still probably seems to me like a one one to two hundred dollar upfront investment they're going to ask especially when it's brand new. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm pretty disappointed. I mean, I don't know that this has been confirmed or anything, but I would suspect based on the, the fact that there's not much actual spec difference now between the Nexus 5 and the Nexus 6, we're going to see those two devices coexist. In addition to that, I mean, even Apple has finally acknowledged that there isn't just one size fits all for phone physical sizes. So for for when when I first heard that the Nexus 6 was going to be a 6-inch device or whatever it is, 5.9 I think. When I first heard that it was going to be a 6-inch class device, I kind of went, "What are they high?" I mean, yeah, <laughs> I know that the Note series does great and I know that Samsung basically created the the hype around this phablet category that is that is doing incredibly well with even Apple jumping on board but to for that to be their only device because that's what we've seen from Google in the past there's the Nexus device and then there's Google Play editions of like other stuff um, but it looks I, I think just for the first time we're gonna get the Nexus 5 to just kind of continue forever or at least for quite a while and then the Nexus 6 is going to be in addition to that so I think the fact that it's priced higher makes more sense that way because if they're still going to offer a a value option and the Nexus 5 is still a great device then they don't have to worry so much about making the Nexus 6 so competitively priced and I gotta wonder if there's pressure on them from the handset makers because uh, it was a few months ago but we we saw a report that I think Apple and Samsung were the only profitable handset divisions within their respective companies. So, you know, guys like HTC who are not doing very well, uh, LG's mobile division has been doing better, but even then I still don't think it's like an exceptional moneymaker for them. Maybe, you know, Google jumping in and kind of going, yay, phones should be commodity cheap, like super cheap, um, was upsetting their partners. Uh, I mean, is is it something where you think if they get enough investment in the platform that is similar to, to like how how consoles are sold that they might be able to provide more of an incentive to manufacturers to selling selling the devices for cheaper? Like, could that be a uh, a business tactic that they could could use to take on Apple and their kind of what they they then could position as like overpriced devices? No, I don't think so because the. It's in no one's on from on the business side of thing. It's in things. It's in no one's best interest to lower the ASP of a category. The only time you're going to lower your average sell price is to try to nickel and dime a competitor. So for Google, why do they care? Because they've already got the lion's share of the mobile market with Apple in a like decisively in second now, and Microsoft just barely even a player, and BlackBerry earlier than (laughs) that so it's not like if they make high-end devices cheaper they're likely to sell more android devices in general or gain more market share and the way google's making their money is through the data mining that they're doing as well as through google play store purchases which maybe they could buy slightly higher end games for their phones but let's face it people who are going to buy a 
you know, $49 device off of a Chinese website are probably not buying $9 apps anyway. So that customer is of no benefit to Google if just because they, there are no additional benefit to Google just because they have higher end phone hardware. Kyle? I think, uh, so, so do you think, cause, cause the Nexus 5 was not anywhere near the, the retail price of, of the Nexus 6. It's like 300 bucks, isn't it? Yeah. So, if if that's such a wide gap going from five to six, but the specs aren't really that much different, are you assuming that Google's going to be releasing some kind of lower end, more affordable price point option in the future? Or is that do you think that's their strategy behind such a such a high price for for the Nexus Six? No, I think it'll just still be the Nexus Five. I think they're just not gonna not gonna have it go away, or they're gonna leave it for now and see how it goes. Um, let's go to Twitter because I kind of said that I would I would listen to people on Twitter about this. So here we go, Ernie. Considering Shield tablet, can you suggest comparable tablets in terms of value and features? Not really. If you want the features a Shield tablet has, then you're kind of stuck with the Shield tablet. Irina says, thinking of getting a new phone, Nexus Six is not going to be it because it's too expensive and too big. Amir says it's too big. Max size for me is five inch. Lollipop tried too hard with material design. It's overdone. Interesting. Uh, Phantom Fish says, I honestly think it looks similar to iOS. Bottom swipe up, graphics, respond to messages from taskbar, etc. Micah, I have a Nexus 7, but I don't have a smartphone. I think the Nexus 6 is too big if I were to buy it. I could just use the 7. And that's a good point where the, the line is blurred. I mean, Google's last gen tablet device is now similar to the size of their current gen phone device. Um, oh yeah, we should probably very briefly go through what the Nexus 9 is. So it's 8.9 inch, 2048 by 1536 IPS display. That's a four by three aspect ratio for those of you who didn't pick up on that. Um, so, so interesting, acknowledging that Apple is right about that. Very interesting. Um, 8 megapixel rear camera, 1.6 megapixel front camera, dual front facing speakers, Tegra K1, uh, assumed to be the 2.5 gigahertz dual core model, though not confirmed, 64 bit processor with 16 or 32 gigs of storage, aluminum construction, and going to be made by HTC. Pricing looks a little bit more reasonable here, 399 for 16 gig, 479 for 32 gig, and 599 for 32 gig with LTE, but again, not Nexus aggressive. I mean, that was the whole thing with the Nexus 7 is, if I recall correctly, that thing launched at what? $199.99 was the original Nexus 7 price? Uh, yes. Generation 1, I believe so. Yeah. One, yeah. one of them might have been 250 Because that was the whole concept, bringing the Google, you know, stock Android experience to the masses. That was what made them so appealing. Well, now, yeah, we get a couple more inches, but is that really worth the couple hundred dollars extra we're paying? Hard to say. Nexus 9 versus Shield Tablet. Oh, Shield Tablet for sure for me. Yeah. If you're a gamer, you got to go for the Shield Tablet. It has the quad core. Um, it has the stylus. Build quality is not metal, but solid. And it has game stream. If you're going to game on it at all, then having having game stream from your GeForce PC is a pretty pretty good thing to have. All right, Jonah the boss. The price is not reasonable. Got it. Um, Oliver says, so is this Android Silver? But maybe they kept the Nexus name. Yeah, there were rumors about Android Silver. Maybe Silver means not cheap anymore, but basically the same thing. Uh, kimchi loved nexus for the low price point after i heard the price my heart sank down to the ground hmm, fandom fish i think we saw this tweet before uh nexus nexus 5 is max size for my largest hands nexus 6 is too big wow there's not a whole lot of positivity about this on twitter here is there there. I think I think people were too like uh, people enjoyed the price of the Nexus Five so much. Like they were just really expecting, oh, they're going to come out with another phone and it's going to be available, and I'm going to be able to buy it with no contract for right. three or four hundred bucks. Of so, all the Nexus devices, really. Yeah. I mean, I bought my second generation Nexus Seven for two hundred twenty bucks, and it wasn't even on sale. And if you think about it, the Nexus Six is is basically just like a Nexus ne Nexus 7, except it's a phone, and it's one inch smaller. But people who are getting the Nexus 6 will virtually have no reason at all to buy a Nexus 7 tablet. Especially yeah, the when Nexus it's, 7 it's, is, it's a third is of the price. Now. 
if I recall correctly. So, yeah. so on the phone side, we might keep Nexus 5 around for quite a while, but on the tablet side, it looks like the entry level Nexus tablet is going to be 400 bucks. Hmm. Uh, Oliver says, looking forward to 60 FPS animations. Not looking forward to apps that don't support material design. Inconsistency in apps is ew. That is a very good point. Nexus 6 is most definitely flagship, but what about it makes it more expensive than the Nexus 9 tablet? <laughs> that's, a, that's, an interesting, that's an interesting point. <laughs> that it can fit in your pocket, barely. No, that, it's, that, the, that the price is so much more than the Nexus 9 tablet, in spite of, like, what are, what are the hardware differences here exactly? I guess it's... Uh, there's less, right? Actually, I have to do math to figure the, that out. Yeah, the, the pixel density isn't as high. There's definitely less pixel density and less, it's a lower overall resolution on the Nexus 9, so the, 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 the display itself could be a, a, a pretty decent factor. Yeah, but the um, funny thing about that is if you've ever shopped for replacement displays for a phone, I bought one for a Droid DNA not that long ago. They're not expensive. Like, even buying them on eBay as an end user, so there's basically, like, negligible sales volume, and you have to pay shipping, and so, like, I think I got it for, like, 70 or 80 bucks shipped hmm. to me. So I'm sure Google isn't paying that much for See? a display for a 5-inch device, regardless of pixel density, because the Droid DNA was a pretty high-end display at the time. That was one of the first 1080p phones. You need to have iFit, iFixit do a teardown of this and list the bomb cost of all of the... Uh... All the components. Yeah, I'd be interested to see if we're getting more, more, if we're getting closer to Apple-like margins on the Nexus Six. <laughs> Google's profiting. Are the cameras the same? I feel like uh, the cameras are thirteen not megapixel. Yeah, the camera's nicer. Thirteen yeah, megapixel Nexus versus eight, eight megapixel. Right. Yeah, better camera, slightly, high, slightly higher pixel count. Uh, it's AMOLED, It's an AMOLED display, so battery life should be pretty strong. Like there, there's stuff going that's good for it, but I guess it all adds up. But yeah, it's still a, a huge gap to fill. All right, so let's move on to our next uh, next topic. This was posted by Bogus on the forum, and uh, the source is Goodwin Proctor. And this is actually pretty funny if you if you have the kind of sense of humor where you get amused by things that are super sad. So Goodwin Proctor publishes a guidebook on litigating with non-practicing entities also known as patent trolls. So there's there's some notes here. A dramatic surge in patent cases filed by NPEs has captured the attention of corporate America as well as state and federal legislators, both private and public sectors fuel ongoing calls for new laws designed to mitigate or eliminate the perceived costs and inefficiencies of patent troll litigation. So in their, in their whole guide to how to deal with this, there were some interesting little nuggets, one of which was that it appears to be actually more profitable to patent troll than to deliver products and, well, not necessarily to deliver products. You're going to make a lot of money if you make a good product and you sell a lot of them. But to be a company that actually makes products and try to sue companies that infringe your patents. So apparently since 2010, patent trolling has been more profitable than actually delivering a product or service to market. Uh, Non-practicing entities tend to be more successful in court than practicing entities. And it's getting to the point where legitimate businesses might start doing it as well. So the stats published by Goodwin Proctor... Um, say that so between 2010 and 2013, the median gain from a patent suit by trolls is eight and a half million. The median gain for legitimate businesses was two and a half million. So that was in 2013 uh, U.S. dollars. This is like saying me and Paul, Paul and I could make more money as drug dealers than running an honest YouTube channel. Well, we probably could, but the well, we problem here is they're doing this under within the bounds of the law. Yeah, and on I mean, the backs of the actual YouTube channels. Some yeah, relaxed morals you'd have to have to. No, this this swing is this way. I, like. There's certain types of things that people do that make that like I really really hate and despise and think is like kind of the lowest. Like, how do you live with yourself as a person if you do this, or like work for a company that does this, like? I don't know. I have to have some kind of of like moral like okayness with the job that I'm doing. I have to have some sort of like investment in like okay, you know, I'm I'm at least on some level like benefiting society or producing something that's of value. But like this type of crap, I just I despise. Like it's 
it's really, really terrible. Greed is it's, a monster in all of us. Yes. Well put, Kyle. Dramatic beer drinking. Drink beer now. So this is this is uh, this is actually this is great. So Michael Strap, a partner at Goodwin and one of the guide's authors, explained uh, why the the damages awarded to trolls are disproportionately high. So there's an economic model for of patent trolling that includes building up like a, a legal war chest by squeezing settlements from dozens of smaller companies, then suing a big fish like a Google or an Apple or something like that. So the patent trolls all are more capable of absorbing a loss in the in these litigations because they've got their war chest and they don't have actual you know, physical inventory that is going to cost them money if all of a sudden they can't sell it because, you know, someone sued them over a, over a patent infringement, for example. Um, the trolls' victories in the small suits can be used as evidence in their suit against the big fish, something that a big fish going after someone who's infringing a patent won't necessarily have because they might not be chasing down every Tom, Dick, and Harry. And then patent trolls normally try to settle outside of court, and the big fish will usually just take a big loss up front rather than the guaranteed legal fees to defend themselves and the threat of an even higher fee if the court does find in favor of the troll. Unbelievable. I mean, I'm not I'm not a legal expert. I think that much should be obvious, but something has to be done. You can't have legitimate companies that are innovating and investing in technologies like Apple and Google and Microsoft being sued by people who aren't actually making anything every time they turn around. And I think it's also because like this type of activity is it's not very tangible, you know? It's like there's legal talk with, involved with it and that sort of thing, so it's difficult for people to grasp at first, like, how it even works. But, like, I mean, it's, equate it to, to, like, cheating in a video game, like an aimbot, something like that. That's, that's what it equates with. I mean, much worse than that, obviously, because there's a lot more money in, at stake. But, like, think of the hatred that people direct towards cheaters online at video games and then like transfer that over to real life please and yeah imagine and, if and they were cheating you out of people. eight and a half million dollars on average yeah <laughs> it's like damn it that guy stole my headshot <laughs> poverty bot oh god poverty bot <sighs> yeah, that's oh. Oh, that's yeah. terrible. This is, this is something to be pissed is this, off about. Is, and is this, you know, has there not been that much backlash against this sort of, this, you know, this is more of a recent crime against humanity, well, so to speak? Well, you can't do anything about it. That's the right. problem is the way the laws are set up now is you, you, can't, you can't do anything. So what are you supposed to do? Nothing. <laughs> I mean, there's, uh, yeah, I, I, don't have, I don't have any good actionable like suggestions for people to take to fix this that's that's probably the the biggest problem i mean this this was one thing when we we were working for newegg that i always appreciated about them was that they their legal team will actually go after some people they've won several cases against some l pretty large patent trolls yeah, and that type I remember of thing that. can be yeah i think there was a patent for like um one click one click checkout or something like that. that yeah, Newegg like basically shop. said screw off. We're gonna. Yeah, there was it. a one click checkout thing. There's like the, the shopping sh cart. The shopping cart patent. Like somebody tried to oh, any online retailer who has a virtual shopping cart, like we have a patent on that, so they all owe us money. And but Newegg like fought him and 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 took him down and that sort of thing. But I mean, that's still just that's like a few. Uh, they, there's like a few wins that they have. And the the amount of this that goes on at, by comparison I think is is massive and I mean just that's what this article is about that it's obviously insanely profitable and the snowballing effect that, that has is insanely profitable thing profitable things like this where people are making that much money they can then offer that money to people who are smart who can like figure out ways to do it better like that's been the problem in the states for quite a long time is a lot of like the smartest people and the smartest graduates from schools are not going into like science, the science sector and that sort of thing. They're going into finance to like learn ways to game the Wall Street better and that sort of thing. It kind of sucks. Anyway, sorry to go off topic. Speaking of uh, money being important, uh, let's go ahead and uh, do our sponsor callouts for today's episode. So Squarespace is 
one of our sponsors today, and they have a whole lot of stuff for me to talk to you guys about this week because it has been a crazy couple of weeks over at Squarespace. First up, I want to show off the winner of this week's Squarespace giveaway because remember guys, you can tweet at me with hashtag Linus Squarespace with your Squarespace site and you can qualify. Woo! Oh, these guys are still here. Go away. Actually, let's just make all these people go away. And you can qualify to win your site free for a year. So in this case, we've got the <clears throat> the Worcester Beach Bots. So you can find some information about them. So you got like some nice pictures and stuff. You got an embedded Twitter feed, all their social media stuff. The site is, of course, nice. It's functional. It's fast because it's Squarespace. It's easy to use on their side, but of course that's something that you guys would have to actually try out Squarespace for in order to uh, in order to be able to verify for yourself. But I would suggest trying it out, verifying for yourself how easily you can create a beautiful website for your blog, business, um, portfolio, whatever else, store, whatever else the case may be, because it's uh, it's actually pretty super awesome. Now, it's gotten a lot more awesome in the last little while. They've actually launched a major, major overhaul. So this is now Squarespace 7. So they've got cover pages. They've got Getty image integration, <clears throat> which is pretty freaking cool, actually. You can get very good deals on Getty images. So your site, even though you don't have a DSLR and like, you know, professional photographer or whatever else, can look really good and have great stock images very affordably. They've got new templates to cater to creators of all kinds. You can use an exact design or you can take a design and customize it to make it your own. They've got a Google partnership to make it easier to manage everything on one platform, including branded email. They've got updated app integration to work seamlessly from computer to Android so you can update your blog, take notes on the go, etc. And their dev platform is finally in full release. So as a developer, you actually have access to to the same resource, the same platform that Squarespace uses for their own site, which is pretty darn cool. And then they've actually got this video that we, they wanted me to show you guys. I'm just going to go ahead and share this on my screen, I guess. Uh, there we go. It was just a pretty cool video. So let's go ahead and screen share with Linus. Woo! This guy is freaking amazing. I had actually never heard of him before, but uh, his name is crap, Alex, Alex something. So they've they've got this video that and so the behind the scenes pictures of this video were bananas. Like getting this shot right here involved having a team of 3 people basically at the at the edge of like this slope above him and then they had this massive boom arm that had the camera kind of hanging down there we go alex honald oh i've heard of this guy i've watched a documentary on him he's insane he's like the world's craziest free climber right yeah his 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 instagram i was i was looking at it it was just incredible absolutely incredible so uh squarespace is just kind of partnering with guys like this to, to bring you guys well this beautiful video this kind of this message about moving beyond the conventional limits and uh i mean their whole vision is just a better more beautiful web so if you guys want your site to be better and more beautiful squarespace.com slash linus for a free trial and for 10 percent off use offer code linus Great video, too. You guys can check that out at squarespace.com slash seven slash templates. You know, I've actually heard a lot about Squarespace lately. Um, two of my, my buddies I reconnected with from high school, they're both uh, full-time web developers now. They, they, they build websites professionally. And I was trying to get my own website started for, uh, for, for my own personal YouTube channel. And I asked them for any suggestions of just like a, a no-brainer site that would just kind of easily handle things for me. And both of them simultaneously were like Squarespace. And yep. so uh, a week later, I signed up for IX web hosting, um, which is not Squarespace. But <laughs> <laughs> wow. Right in because, the middle of my sponsorship spot. Because, because Steve from Newegg is, is an idiot, and he convinced me of the wrong choice, clearly. And I, I, succumb, I, succ I had succumbed to the, the persuasion that is Steve. You should, you should probably sorry. try out Squarespace. If you buy a year at a time, so then they throw in your domain cost for free. And... Uh, and you get a discount, obviously, because you buy a year at a time. And, oh, yeah, guys, check out this. So this Instagram picture is what I was talking about a second ago. Right there. Three guys. One cup. 
on Jeez. this like <laughs> massive, massive boom arm with the camera above him here. Just absolutely oh my freaking God. incredible. What's the name of that uh, Instagram account? Um, do, 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 do. Sorry, I will find it. If that not, out I'll find you. it. Yeah, it's just All his right. name, Alex Honnold with two cool. N's. All right, so our second sponsor today is 5-4 Club, and they have a new offer that we don't normally do. 5-4 Club tries all kinds of stuff with us, so they've tried, like, a discount, and they've tried putting, like, cash in the box, and now they're trying something completely different, and I'm actually gonna get, I'm gonna get all the numbers right this time. 5-4 Club is the sponsor who's integration spots i have screwed up more than any other sponsor it's a bloody miracle that they actually even advertise with us anymore because i've given the wrong pricing i've given the wrong um like discount amount I've, I've done it i've done everything everything wrong with these guys anyway this time we've got it right bit.ly slash linus ffc use offer code linus2 for an extra item in your first package and what would the items in your package be you might ask well 54 club is the club that you join if you want to be well dressed and you want to do it without putting any effort into it whatsoever basically you go on their site you take a survey that takes literally seconds so you just click get started, you go through a survey, you tell them, you know, about your style, what you like to wear, your sizing, and then they have your personal style advisor pick out clothes for you every month and send them to you. So the membership costs 60 bucks a month. I'm just gonna double check that, make sure. Yes, good, see, I got it right this time. The membership costs 60 bucks a month and compared to the retail pricing on their clothing, you're gonna be paying about half. So if you're on their site and you say, okay, well, these cost about 120, dollars that's about how much at least at least 120 dollars worth every month you get for 60 bucks and what they're doing for us is with offer code linus2 you get an extra item worth 35 to 40 bucks in your package every or not every month the first month see i almost said every month and i almost screwed it up again but i'm not going to do it this time five four club guys and i clicked the wrong lower third okay i did manage dropping to screw the it up. ball man i can't dropping do anything right i something about five four club it's a curse Whatever. I, w I wear their shirts in my tech quickie videos all the time because i really like that one shirt it's just got a nice little nice little 5-4 logo and it's like really comfy and the buttons look nice people compliment me on that shirt all the time actually i've seen, I've seen that shirt it's a nice shirt it is a nice shirt i actually pay, really like it. i'd pay 60 bucks a month for compliments i never get those <laughs> and you're fishing you, for them right you now do enjoy you enjoy fishing <laughs> though, don't you kyle Speaking of uh, being willing to pay 60 bucks a month for compliments, I have something nice to say about BlackBerry. Um, they can't keep their passport in stock. I don't know if this is more to do with the fact that they didn't produce enough of them or more to do with that they, uh, it's a really great, amazing square device with a keyboard on it that people really, really want to buy. But uh, there you go. They sold 200,000 passports within two days of launch and stock was apparently completely wiped out after six hours of sales. Amazon alerted purchasers by email that their passport had an expected delivery date of October 17th to 20th with shop BlackBerry quoting October 29th as the delivery date. So things are looking up maybe for the BlackBerry brand as they saw an operating loss of only 207 million last Last quarter below analyst expectations. Um, they expected a loss of 16 cents per share and only ended up losing 2 cents per share after exclusions. So I haven't tried the passport. I feel like I, I kind of, I was very dismissive of it when I first heard about it, but um, would love to hear what you guys think about the passport actually uh we're gonna do a straw poll for this one rather than a twitter blitz just because uh that way we can have something up while we move on to the next topic we don't actually have a ton of time left which is sort of unfortunate but um yeah, so much Black deep conversation Berry. going on blackberry passport yay nay meh those are going to be the options because i don't have a whole lot of time to create this poll all right. It it's an important one. It is an important one. I really want to know what people think of stuff like this. It's like, what the heck is this thing? I realize now that I haven't actually shown a picture of it on screen, so I should probably do that just for Looks folks like who are Looks like we got aren't... a spammer in the chat, Linus. I think you need to kick someone. Yeah, I know, right? I should kick that Linus tech guy. What a jerk. Pasta. All right. Here it is. Oh. 
What, so what uh, is is this BlackBerry still running their own their own operating system? Uh, yes, but apparently the integration of the Play Store is much better now, and you can basically just oh. install Android apps. Oh, that's so cool. So they're not nearly as limited in terms of app support. Right, there it is. All right, line of screen share. Boom, BlackBerry Passport. Got your full keyboard. Also got a nice large touch screen. Um, looks like a very, you know, a, a productivity friendly more square aspect ratio, so I can see what people like about it. Um, I'm just just not sure if it's uh, if it's the right thing for me necessarily. All right, so let's move on to the next topic here. Um, wow, there's a lot of topics that I haven't even touched yet. We're just going to have to go through these pretty fast. Facebook's next phone might be built by Samsung. There's been a few meetings between top brass at both companies and the failure of the HTC first, which was the first Facebook phone, um, is not stopping them from planning a new phone necessarily. And I don't think we're going to see like a, like a Facebook only phone or anything like that, but it's more likely to be something with some Facebook features integrated into it. I mean, Samsung's one of the few Android handset makers that is still really sticking with their own skin on top of Android that is really quite different from how Android is supposed to work. LG actually as well, I guess they still have quite a few differences, but um, I could see Samsung potentially working in more Facebook integration. Not sure how beneficial that would necessarily be to users, but hey, whatever, it's TouchWiz, so it wouldn't be the first time. Um, YouTube ads linking to malicious sites. This was posted on the forum by Rainfall Within, and it's from the Trend Micro blog that we got this information. Basically, these ads were appearing in videos with up to 11 million views, and they don't take you directly to malicious sites, but rather first through advertising sites. So the exploit used in this attack was the Sweet Orange exploit kit, which uses certain vulnerabilities in Java Flash and IE. And the final payload of the attack are variants of the Covter malware family, which is known for ransomware attacks. So there have been 113,000 victims, with 95% of them being from the US. Mind you, there was a patch for this attack in May 2013, so if you keep your windows up to date, you're probably okay. Now we've got something that I'm sure Paul and Kyle are going to want to weigh in. Bethesda to officially support 60 FPS with the evil within on PC. This is posted by Spooty on the forum, and the original article is from PC Gamer, and it sounds like great news on the surface. I mean, we get some console commands for things like God Mode, which is cool, no clip, which is cool, but by 30 FPS, they mean they're unlocking it from the previously rumored 30 frames per second lock to 60 FPS only. So you may run the game at 30 FPS or 60 FPS, but not more FPS. And they are saying that there's going to be potentially some glitches in the game at 60 frames per second at launch, but that they will fix them and anything else, you can set whatever resolution you want, but it's going to be glitchy and they're not going to fix it. Well, kids, can I get a better, uh, can 60 I get is a, better than 30, but it's still not ideal um, for, for, for gamers that have 144 hertz or 120 hertz refresh rate monitors. I mean, I, I think they're still going to be disappointed. You're going to appease some of the population, but uh, for the majority, it just seems like they're trying to cover up their, their mistake or, or whatnot. So it's, is it like trying, I feel like I'm trying to look a, a gift horse in the mouth here because. It's nice that they, I mean, no, no, actually, never mind. I'm changing my mind right now. Screw that, because we should not be like, oh, well, it was nice of them to at least give 60. They should have given 60 at the beginning without, <laughs> exactly, having, to, yeah. without having to come out and be like, oh, well, we'll maybe give you 60, but we're not really going to actually put any effort into it or support it or anything like that. This is, this is half-assed, and, uh, and, and, and... And we and expect Bethesda's your full ass developer. next time, Bethesda. I have, a, I have a negative opinion of it. That's what I've decided. Yes. Okay. I'm not I'm not impressed. <laughs> all right. Well, there's a couple things I need to mention here really briefly. First of all, we got our poll results for the BlackBerry Passport with the overwhelming majority saying meh or nay and 17% <laughs> saying yay, which is interesting because 17% of the smartphone market would still be a very viable business for BlackBerry. It's also, not a negligible amount. 
Also, I realized that I never showed the picture of the extra item from 5.4. So once again, I have screwed up a 5.4 integration. That is the Henley that you get. Don't worry, it doesn't have a crazy pattern on it. It's just made from a ribbed material. Actually, it looks quite nice. So there you go. I screwed up all the things once again. Go team Linus. <laughs> this is why this is why you need shirt. slick. So but yeah, because normally I can kind of do these things while he while he handles a topic on his own, but I don't trust you guys that much. Yeah. All right. For good reason. Well, I did have a half an hour to look over all the topics. So, oh, yeah, back to the evil within. <laughs> there are other problems too. You can change the aspect ratio but some gameplay prompts appear in the cinematic black bars that are going to only be there if you're running in the correct cinematic aspect ratio. So you just won't see those things if you change the aspect ratio. And no, that will not be fixed either, apparently. If, if they were really serious about like wanting to give people a better experience of that higher frame rate, they would just make it all open source so that the modders could go in who are really passionate about it fix all those issues and make it run at 60 hertz or 60 frames per frames. second or even beyond. You don't even have to make it open source for that. You just have to just, mod. You just have to enable modders, yeah. Allow some mods some to go in there. Yeah. Um, okay, so of course oops, sorry, wrong thing. Uh, so of course there was a big Apple event this week. Um, and I guess I'll have to do a very quick summary because quite frankly there wasn't that much of interest I mean Apple pay is coming Monday, which is really cool. They've got hundreds of banks signed up They've got lots of merchants signed up um, I mean for me personally the time savings of whipping out my phone and trying it first and then realizing that you know half the time plus it's not gonna work and needing to take out my card anyway is very limited but the privacy improvements do look pretty impressive so Apple basically stores any of your card information in that isolated non-network connected chip that's right on the phone the same place they keep your fingerprint information and they share none of this info with the retailer which is which is very very cool so you don't have to worry about your you know, ID being seen by someone as you hand it to them. You don't have to worry about um, your credit card number being more easy, being easier to steal. I mean, actually, there was a leak. There was a leak this week, wasn't there? Another retailer lost a bunch of credit cards. What, another one? I think so. I didn't, I didn't catch that. Yeah, uh, no, I chances could, I are could be you're wrong. right. Whatever, it happens from time to time, so the retailer themselves wouldn't even need your credit card information in order to process your payment, which is very cool, and it's coming. Also, we get a Retina 5K 27-inch iMac that's super thin, comes with mobile 290 GPUs, and a 295, whatever that is, I'm not 100% sure what that is, but don't get too wrapped up in how great a mobile 290 sounds, because that's actually a Pitcairn GPU, so it's very similar to a 7870 actually not really that special in terms of performance. This is not a mobile 290 to a regular 290 is not what a mobile, you know, GTX 980 is to a desktop GTX 980. AMD hasn't gotten there yet. Um, so 5K 5120 by 2880 res. It's got Thunderbolt 2. SSD is not standard still for some reason. It's got the latest Core i7s and that all sounds pretty good if you're one of those people who is into all-in-ones rather than having something that just functions as a display and then something that you connect to it because that is more modular, which is good. Um, yeah, uh, the new iPad Air 2 and iPad Mini 3 are coming. So they've sold 225 million iPads, evidently, since they started selling them, which is unbelievable. That's like eight times the number of people in Canada altogether. It's a lot of iPads. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot this of is, iPads. This is starting from the very first iPad ever created? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, and I think that's something like over four times what Samsung has sold total, in spite of them having so many models of tablets. So it's very, very impressive. And then did you, we've did got... you hear? Did you happen to hear about the, uh, the the Microsoft Surface fiasco, the deal they signed with the NFL? Yeah, I they... did. Okay, that I thought that was. Yeah, with all the commentators calling them iPads on air, yes. even though. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the iPad is so, to the average person, it, it, that's just what a tablet is, iPad. Right, it's, it's exactly. Kleenex. And it's, it's funny, because in the tech space, we don't think about that, because obviously an iPad's an iPad, and a, other tablet's an other tablet, but no, to regular people, they just don't give two craps, and an iPad's a tablet. Uh, um, well, gotta love regular people. 
So the new iPad Air 2 is 18% thinner, the screen is less reflective, it's got an A8X SoC, which actually has 50% more transistors than the A8 that we find in the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus. Very interesting, not sure uh, necessarily exactly where all those transistors went, but performance should be pretty darn impressive. It's got a better camera, so you can be a pad hole, walk around, take pictures, and now features Touch ID, which I guess is good. Um, also, the uh, the uh, Mac Mini got an update with the latest Intel CPUs with Intel Iris graphics, two Thunderbolt 2 ports, PCI Express storage, and AC wireless. Oh yeah, the wireless on the new iPad is apparently faster too, so I guess that's cool. So the one the one thing about this whole Apple event that is kind of irritating me is since since the new version of the operating system is called Yosemite, uh, I feel like they've been co-opting images of Yosemite and using them for Apple branding, and it pisses me off. <laughs> Mother Nature is going to sue Apple I, well, uh, as the ultimate who's, irony. Who's going to go and be like, no, Half Dome is a registered trademark of Yosemite and and Apple, and apparently now also an Apple. Like, I don't want I don't want Half Dome to be used to sell Apple products. Apple is reportedly suing Mother Nature for the usage of Half Dome and its all of its marketing branding. Okay, sorry. Okay, sorry. Oh yeah, I guess I didn't really talk about um, the new OS 10 at all. I guess I just don't care. And uh, yep. Hey -o. Cheers. Well, it's not it's not that I don't care because it's bad. I just don't care because I didn't use the old one. So all these new amazing differences mean nothing to me because I don't have any frustrations with the old one or anything that I like about the old one. It just is what it is. Speaking of things that are what they are, augmented reality might not be necessarily what we thought it was going to be. I mean, I think that Google Glass looked very augmented reality from the beginning. Like, we were kind of thinking we were going to be wearing glasses or goggles or whatever else. But there's this is a rumor right now, but Google and others may invest $500 million into augmented reality company Magic Leap, who isn't going to be putting a lens in front of your eyes, but rather is planning to be basically beam the image into your eyes, allegedly solving the need for higher resolution in this, that solutions like Oculus Rift with, the, with a headset are going to have. So the vision would be to have the product display an image into the eye so that instead of having to pull out a phone, you would just see things in the world around you that, I mean, it's funny, they're calling it cinematic reality because they think augmented reality is a bit of a, an, undersells the technology a little bit because of how realistic it is. But I mean, this is what it is. Here's an elephant, an augmented reality elephant in the hand of someone. You can call it whatever you want, but it's still augmented reality. Uh, looks incredibly cool and gaming with a technology like this where you don't even have to wear a headset and you just see stuff that isn't there? Wow. So uh, I'm, I'm getting this image in my head of like, kind of like in the Matrix, you know, when he wakes up and there's just the rows and rows of people, you know, they're all, all in their little pods. Like something like that with all these people and, and these little devices in front of them just beaming images like directly into their brain. But, but really what this has inspired me to do is developed my own device kind of based on this same technology which is going to be a food delivery system that puts a tube down your throat and just puts the food directly into your stomach that way you don't have to worry about the whole chewing and swallowing thing I you think could partner easier. with um partner with the guys that make soylent exactly yeah <laughs> Luke's been yeah. on. Has is Luke like? Does Luke look paler or anything like that, or is he like becoming more and more stronger than he has ever been? Since no, he's, he's been on he Soylent. seems he seems all right. He's not entirely on Soylent though. He does oh, okay. he does eat it for you know most of his nutritional stuff, but he still eats, uh, but mostly just because eating is kind of nice and things taste good, and Soylent doesn't taste that great. I'm, I'm glad you've been feeding him. Yeah, well, well I don't feed him. He has to oh. feed himself. Oh, okay. I just watch. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, so, it's liquid, right? So the, there's just these visuals I have of Linus feeding Luke with like a big baby bottle or something. <laughs> <laughs> right? That could yeah, be a t-shirt. That's the Make a t worst that. image that's ever been Call in me. anyone's head during this show. Call I'm happy daddy. to have brought it to all of your fans. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. You guys will never be on my show again. Uh, get off. All right, so um, Skype 
Kik, I guess would be how we pronounce this, Q-I-K. This was originally posted by Good Bites on the forum. The article is from TheVerge.com. And this is supposed to be a <clears throat> an attempt to take over mobile video messaging. So it, this actually started out as just a, a video consumption platform, but, oh, I just realized I'm not actually screen sharing with you guys. So there you go. They've, they're showing it running on Windows Phone, as if that matters, iOS and Android unless that HTC One M8 is a Windows Phone version of the HTC One M8, which it probably dun, dun, isn't, because I don't think anyone ever actually bought one of those. Um, although I'd love to be proven wrong. You know, it's amazing how many people are hating on me for my negativity about the Windows Phone HTC One M8 in my review, and yet I have never seen one. I've never heard any report of anyone owning it ever. And people misinterpreted a lot of what I said. I didn't say Windows 8 phone is a platform for nobody. What I said was this is a device for nobody, a high-end, truly high-end, premium cost device that run, runs Windows Phone because the people who buy high-end devices are going to have needs for their mobile devices that go beyond what Windows Phone can do because the app ecosystem is so immature. Speaking of which, I'm still super upset that the NFC chip in here only does Apple Pay and doesn't do other stuff. Anyway, it started as a video streaming service, was available on mobile devices before YouTube. So this is kind of an old platform. It's all done through your mobile phone number. No account signup is necessary. It's been being pitched as an alternative to text messaging and can easily switch between the front and rear cameras while recording. There's no preview or processing and it has a 42 second max recording. You can send to one person or a group. And if your friend doesn't have Kick, they will receive an SMS with instructions on how to download it. So you can pre-record up to 12 messages for use when you're in a rush. So just pre-recorded like, hey, I can't talk right now. I don't know why people would want that instead of an SMS, but sure, whatever. Yeah, and the that, messages disappear after two weeks if they aren't deleted. Like practically speaking to me, this, this seems like something that might be a competitor for like Vine or something like that, but like no, because it's the, messaging, not broadcast. It's more so like like can, like Snapchat. It's more like a competitor to Snapchat. But, but except, like, so the, now we can have videos of penises instead of pictures of them. Like, is that what you we're can, doing? You here? can do video with Snapchat too. That was a benefit that I hadn't considered. But I mean, the beautiful <laughs> the beautiful thing about a text message is when I get a text message, I can glance at my phone without unlocking, without doing anything, and it can appear on one or two lines, and I can immediately know what was said, and it's faster than watching a short video of somebody being like, hey, man, I'll call you later or something like that. Like, <laughs> Well, that's a stupid reason to, to send a video to someone, just to tell them that you'll call them later. But that's but it has pre-recorded like, messages like, yeah. hey, I'm in class right now. Like That's the kind of thing people use that stuff for. So, an, but the pre-recorded stuff is useless. It's, it's all garbage. It's short message service. It's supposed to be like a quick communication, a quick interaction with someone. And this, feels, this feels like a step backwards. This feels yeah. like video voicemail. <laughs> All right, they, exactly. One one application I could see this in is like let's say you're in a in a place that you've never been before and you're meeting someone there for the first time. You could send them a message and say, "Hey, I'm here waiting for you." You could I'm also right send them the an Starbucks. MMS with a picture of you. Yeah, but the picture is is only goes so far. <laughs> if you're in a location, they need to see visually where you are, 360 degree view. You can actually give them a panoramic shot of where you are, meet me in this location, so they can recognize it when they walk up to the place. So you could send them a panoramic picture. <laughs> So you can send them a panoramic picture or video. You can send them three pictures. <laughs> Fail, Kyle! Fail! No! Put a filter on it, Linus. Kyle's already Put a filter on Kyle it. Kyle has already invested in Quick, I think, which is why he's really... Uh, I am the so, first investor in Quick. Right. Is it Quick or Kick? I don't kick? care. I don't kick. Know. If it's a Q, I feel like it should be... Qu but Maybe there's no U. Kick. No, you're right. It's Okay. The U is not silent because it's not there. It's not proper, like, use of Q anyway. This is cool. This was posted by R. R. Bolson on the forum, and it's the Carl Zeiss VR1. So we know about Samsung's VR headset for the Note, and we know about uh, Google Cardboard, which is obviously not going to be the greatest solution ever because it's, like, going to fall apart and stuff. But this is the VR1, which is a more flexible one. So you basically just buy, like, a, like a tray. So here's what one of the... Really? I can't mouse over this without... This stupid thing. Well, whatever. So you guys will have to envision my mouse over there. So you buy a tray that your phone slips into, anything from 4.7 to 5.2 inches, and then you can use your phone as a, as VR. So that's cool, I guess. Moving right along. Um, PewDiePie may be starting his own YouTube network. So this was an interview with um, 
uh, Pulse2.com, and then he was also on the cover of IconMagazine.se. This was posted by Tech Dreamer on the forum and actually generated a lot of discussion. Um, he makes an estimated four million per year in ad sales, so that's gross. Um, and that was last year, so I'm going to assure you it's a lot more this year. Plans to leave Maker Studios in December to create his own network. Thinks other networks have been managed in such an incredibly poor way that it's silly and would like to help other YouTubers. And say what you want about pewds, you know, how you might like or dislike his content or whatever. The guy's smart, and uh, maybe I should join his network. How do, right, how do you know he's smart? How do you know he's not just incredibly lucky? And anyone a, a remotely attractive for no. a YouTube personality. Anyone, anyone at the top of any field is smart. Guarantee it. I, I, I don't know. Octomom Even... had some some fame there for. Sorry, a who? <laughs> Octomom. Octomom. Yeah, but that's not the top of a field. That's a fifteen minutes of fame. I'm talking she someone who is in a field a, of her own. In that's a even... sustained, repeated manner, beat everyone else who competes at something. Seen some actors who who wouldn't what line does, up with that. But what does PewDiePie do that no one else can do? I mean, but, I hold on seen... a second. Okay, remember, you some actors that are dumb, sure. But I said at the top of a field, PewDiePie is the number one YouTuber. Put That's me at the number sure. one of anything where the person's an idiot. You can't do it. Are you still on a network or at this point, Linus? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with Twitch right now, but I'm actually okay. probably switching on YouTube. On Twitch TV, I'm still going to stay partnered with Twitch. I'm still going to do all my streaming on Twitch. But on YouTube, I'll potentially be moving over to... Um, wow, I feel bad for not remembering. Maker Studios. Oh, okay. Wait, isn't that, isn't Maker? that where PewDiePie, no, PewDiePie is leaving? PewDiePie is leaving that. No, network. I think that might be why I have Maker Studios in my head. I'm going to have to look it up now. When's the Linus network coming, and so, when can I join? And do you feel like you have some big shoes to fill? And sure, yes, I'll join your network. Replacing PewDiePie Thanks on for the Maker asking. Studios network. <laughs> Sorry, I feel, I feel bad. Full screen, full screen. Yeah. Sorry, not Maker. I've talked to every network at some point in time. Hey, we're on full screen. Full screen. Yeah, full screen's awesome. Yeah, yeah so, I, um, so I might be joining full screen. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I like full screen. I don't have a problem with them. Before. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, see if we've got any more. Oh, yeah, Netflix raises the price for 4K video streaming. This was posted by Tech Dreamer on the forum. And this is actually the second price hike we've seen from Netflix in, like, what, a year? So, and that was after, for a long time, the pricing being very, very stable. So if you signed up for a 4K enabled account already, you get to keep your current subscription price until August 12th, 2016. But for new subscribers, the monthly price for 4K will be 12 bucks. So you can enjoy 4K content like Breaking Bad, House of Cards, and the Smurfs on your 4K TV that you also probably don't own yet. Um, although 4K doesn't work on all TVs, you need to have a supported TV. So once again, early adopters for any new video standard get the old kick in the teeth. Way to go. You spent way too much on something that not only didn't work when you bought it, but isn't even going to work at the time that it was supposed to work. That's why you go with an HTPC. It's, it's pretty normal. Yeah. But, uh... Yeah, th this was one of those stories where I was like, okay, I, I mean, I think the people right now who have the capability to watch Netflix in 4K aren't really probably going to be too pissed off by three extra dollars a month. Um, I would hope that once it becomes a little bit more mainstream, maybe they'll do like a discount plan or something. Knock it down to 10. I'll sign up for 10. All right, so uh, next up, we've got the snapping. Snap saved images leaked. So 500 megs of images were leaked according to Snap Saved. Snapsaved.com is a website that allows users to save Snapchat messages, and it was compromised. Their database was immediately deleted when the hack was discovered, but there are concerns that many of the leaked images could be classified as child porn. So, yeah... A, that's a messy situation. I guess that's all there is to really say about that. <laughs> Although, one Pirate Bay user complained that so far from what I've seen, the vast majority are just black screens with text overlaid or just a normal selfie. That would be my initial response. Be like, man, the pictures aren't even that good. Nexus Player is coming. So this was posted by Lols on the forum. The original source is Google's own page about it. So let's go check that thing out. Ooh, Nexus Player. So, um... You know, ooh yeah, good idea, but probably ahead of your time a little bit there. 
And the page is loading a bit slowly, so sorry about that. But uh, at any rate, the Nexus player is coming. It's going to come with a remote and a controller. The remote has voice search, comes with apps such as Netflix and TED. There's a full list uh, on, the, on the Google page for it that I would love to show you, except that it's not loading right now. And it has free online multiplayer from Google Play Games. So the thing that all consoles should always have forever because it's just baffling to me that you have to pay to subscribe to a multiplayer service when you already bought the game and you already have your internet connection. Um, it's got a 1.8 gigahertz quad core Intel Atom processor, 802.11 AC, 2x2 MIMO, so that's a pretty good wireless solution, HDMI out, and it'll cost $100 and the controller will cost 40 bucks. And um, one thing though that's missing, and it better have a good wireless solution because it does not have a wired network connection. That's a bit of a killer for me. Oh, damn. Yeah, I, I, I personally have to pee. I'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Kyle. We should end the show while he's right. gone so that yes. I don't have to talk about where people can go watch Kyle make videos. That's all right. Yeah, we'll leave, we'll leave uh, his plugs out of it. So, so this is like, I don't know, this is like the upgrade to the Chromecast, I guess. It's, it's Android-based. It's, it's got a better processor, and you can actually play games on it, and it's only 100 bucks. Yeah, it looks that way. Yeah. How many Android? So you do you you've been using your Shield and everything to play games like yep. you know, uh, like do you actually play any Android platform games? Or no, they're all just, rubbish. Yeah, so I guess that would be my issue. Would be <laughs> sure you can play Android games, but I don't play any Android games, so the draw really isn't there for me. But I mean, I don't know. For a hundred dollars, this is a tough bucks. sell for me. I'd rather yeah. spend. I think Shield Shield Portable is down to what two hundred bucks now. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I'd rather have one of those and run it in console mode for sure. You'd have a lot more flexibility with uh, what you could play on it. That's that's for damn sure. Yep. So original article here is from New York Times. And that is that uh, HBO is to start their own standalone streaming service come 2015, which is, uh, I, I guess, pretty cool. Uh, actually, very cool, because now you won't have to have a cable subscription in order to get access to HBO programming. Um, so this intensifies their growing rivalry with Netflix. HBO is trying to cater to the new generation that doesn't have any interest in cable subscriptions. I have only had one when my cable provider offered it to me for free. I watched hockey games. That was it. 10 million homes in the U.S. have no cable or satellite subscription but do have internet. Half of those are subscribed to a streaming surface, uh, surface service. So uh, CEO of HBO says it's time to remove all barriers to those who want HBO. All in, there are 80 million homes in the U.S. that do not have HBO, and we will use all means at our disposal to go after them. So there you go. So, so th there's, there's that uh, popular webcomic. I think it was from The Oatmeal, where somebody was like, I want to watch games, Game of Thrones, but I want to do it legit. Stop cracking your... Sorry. <laughs> but I want to do it legitimately. And then there's, the whole comic was about them trying to legitimately watch Game of Thrones and then eventually giving up and, and pirating. pirating it. This is my only my only issue here. That this is going to make that argument a lot more difficult. Anyone who pirates Game of Thrones regularly, now no excuse. They 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 have much less of an excuse, and that's really. But, but now this this uh, to me signals the beginning of the end of of cable TV, and yep. the world. Yeah, I I don't understand why it still needs to exist. Kyle used a little bit more hyperbole there, but just just a bit of embellishment. I guess, All right, we've got sense. a few more rapid-fire topics, but i got to go through these incredibly quickly because we've completely run out of time. Amazon to open a physical store in New York. It could act as a way to highlight products like Fire TV. Um, this is a breakthrough. It's a revolutionary uh, thing that Amazon has done here. Yeah, opening uh, a store. <laughs> maybe New Egg will follow suit, and then maybe NCIX will open a retail... Oh, wait, no, they've already got them. Okay. They have them. They, they're called the hybrid center. We're like the hipsters of the tech industry. Yeah. All right, Corsair RGB keyboards, allegedly only producing 512 colors. It is advertised as supporting 8-bit color, giving 16.8 million total color combinations. However, it has been found to support only 3-bit color, giving 512 combinations. Um, to people who are sort of blown away by this, all I really have to say is... Corsair is doing what they had to do here, I think. I, I don't think it's right. I don't think it's right for anyone to advertise 16.8 million RGB lighting in a product when it's 
obviously not actually 16.8 million color combinations, but like, let's take, uh, it's, the cable's trapped under something here. Let's take this mouse, for example. This is a Logitech mouse. Logitech is a big company, a good company, good people. That LED lighting is advertised as 16.8 million. There's no way. There's no way in hell that it produces 16.8 million colors. If you guys have ever had an RGB product, drag the color wheel around. You know, take two yellows that are similar and see if you can actually see the difference in the LED. There is no difference because it doesn't actually do it. It's never actually done it. And if anything, Corsair's transitions much more smoothly, in my experience, than the Black Widow Ultimate Chroma anyway, and a lot more smoothly than a lot of other RGB products I've seen. So I really wonder how many colors most RGB products out there actually support. Like I said, still wrong, shame on you Corsair, but there you go. According to the forum users, the issue is that uh, is either that they are constrained to the USB protocol that only supports three bits per channel, or because the three Panasonic A32181 LED matrix ICs they use to control the keyboard are only able to give individual LEDs three bits of control per channel. So there you go. I don't think there's been an official statement from Corsair, but um, yeah. Futuremark launches the world's first 4K benchmark. This was posted by TechFanboy on the forum, and it's the sources from kitguru.net. Firestrike Ultra renders the Firestrike benchmark in 4K. You need at least three gigs of VRAM to run the benchmark, and the leaderboards are live. There's a JBL special edition of the OnePlus One and earphones, but I don't really like talking about OnePlus One because I think that they're OnePlus One. Uh, it is what it is. OnePlus Two. Oh, that three. equals two. It's the answer to the equation. Um, so. Apple patents flexible device display input method, so the device would react to bending using that as an input method. Very cool. And Asus Strix mechanical keyboards with blue, black, brown, and red key switches are either available now or coming soon. I actually haven't seen if they're on sale yet. This was posted by Quirtius. Oh yeah, and the Apple patent thing was from Tech Dreamer. Uh, this was posted by Quirtius on the forum, and this is the Strix Tactic Pro. There we what? go. It, really? How how is Asus and Corsair going to be buddy buddy now that Asus has like mice and keyboards and headsets and headsets and I think they had cases at one point, didn't they? Uh, they have like I know they have like server cases. They sell like you know kind of bare bones server systems and stuff. I'm not sure if they have like mainstream consumer gamer cases or anything like that. I can't but I wouldn't zoom be in on this. Wouldn't properly. be surprised if they did. Well, at any rate, it's a gaming keyboard, it's mechanical, it's got some macro keys on the left, pricing looks reasonable, it's got N key rollover, and uh, it's got three more macro keys under the spacebar, a position that I personally really, really like for them, because whenever you're not jumping, you might as well be macroing something, and more than maybe more than one thing. And I think that's pretty much it for my topic, so I guess the, the, the rest here is, you know what, actually, maybe, do you mind, do you guys mind if we end the show and then we come back immediately for a quick after party? Maybe you guys can update me on how things are going now that sure. you're free from the shackles that bound you? Of course. Yeah, why not? All right, let's do that. So the after party will be back in like a couple seconds here. I'll never get this right. They can hear you, by the way. Damn it! Hello! So they can hear us when they can't see us? Yes. So you could be naked, it and is, you wouldn't be bothering them anymore than you normally do. This is Paul. This is Paul. I hate all back. of you. Unsubscribe. Squarespace <laughs> and 5-4 Club, our sponsors. Thank you, sponsors, for making oh. our show possible. Brofist. All right, sponsors.